Hey, welcome to a new program that we have, Inspirational Focus, and it's a pleasure to introduce, uh, as, a, as a permanent host, uh, Deacon Terry A. Cox. He's a permanent deacon with the Roman Catholic Church, and it's going to be interesting to find out all the different things that Terry has been involved in that led to him becoming a permanent deacon. So stay tuned. Welcome to a new program, a series of programs that we are going to be having here at the Ohio State University South Centers, in which uh, these shows will be aired on uh, other network programs, uh, especially during Sunday mornings. And it, it is a great pleasure to be able to talk with an individual who uh, is married, has six children, nine grandchildren, and also as a permanent deacon with the Roman Catholic Church. I'll be quite frank with you, growing up as a Catholic, I knew about permanent deacons, but this is the first time I really got a chance to talk with, with an individual. So I, I want to take this opportunity to welcome Terry A. Cox, Deacon Terry A. Cox. It is a pleasure having you on the program. It's good being here. Uh, and, uh, you know, before we get into a lot of the different uh, simple questions that I have, uh, tell the listening audience a little bit about yourself. As you said, I am married. Um, I have six children, five daughters and one son, the son being the oldest, and I have currently nine grandchildren. Uh, most recent are a set of twin boys who, was born, who were born five months ago. Um, I've been married for 47 years, and I have been a deacon now for eight years, almost eight years. Six years, I'm sorry, my math. Uh, <laughs> the way time goes by, you know, it just seemed like it was just yeah. yesterday. I was ordained in November of 2012. Ah, okay, all right. And I, I, I know that uh, uh, as a permanent deacon, et cetera, uh, it would be considered one step below a priest, a Catholic priest, if I could say that. Not... It, for most people, it would seem that way, but it's not really. Uh, as a deacon, there are two types of deacon in the Catholic Church. Oh, okay. Uh, one is the permanent deacons, which I am, and the second is the transitional deacons, and those are typically seminarians who go on to be priests. I see, I see. They are a deacon for one year uh, prior to their ordination oh, I see, I see. I, I, I know that uh, there are many, when, when studying to be a Catholic priest, you go through four years of undergraduate. Right. And then you have four years of theology. Correct. And, and it's my understanding that usually the third year uh, that, of, that in theology, you become that transitional deacon. They, they, ordained, they are ordained as a deacon at that point in time. Okay. Then, uh, God willing, then one year later, sure. they are sure. ordained as a priest. I see, I see. And, and, and so uh, you assist at the uh, Catholic services and the Mass and things I, that I do assist a priest at the Mass. Okay. And as a, as a permanent deacon, what, what are some of the uh, duties, responsibilities that you have in working with a, a, a parish? Okay, at the Mass, um, I am the primary person who proclaims the Gospel. I see. Uh, that is the responsibility of the deacon. And we also are considered, we are a ordinary minister of the Eucharist, which okay. means that we assist the priest in distributing the Eucharist. Okay. But in the consecration, that is really... The great. consecration is the responsibility of the priest. Oh, I and see. The deacon has no responsibility. Right, right. Okay. And uh, when you also talk about the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, you are, are able to give sermons or discussions or, 
In the Catholic Church, is it called a sermon? It's called a homily. Homily. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, I am authorized. I have faculties to uh, proclaim to give a homily at Mass. Okay. Whenever, if, whenever the priest wishes. Huh. Oh, that that's interesting. Uh, so, what led you to become a a deacon? I, I'm assuming that uh, since you have been married for 47 years and you were ordained a permanent deacon in 2012, that you have been married and the family have been growing. What, what sort of led you to become, uh, to consider becoming a deacon? Well, the obvious answer is God called me to be a deacon. Okay. But how did that call come about is what people yeah. have to discern. Yeah. Um, in my case, I knew a couple of deacons um, and was watching them at Mass. And over the years, I thought, well, do I, would I like to be a deacon? Um, does God want me to be a deacon? So this kind of entered my mind several times over a period of several years, many times. And finally I decided, yes, I think that at this point, God is calling me to be oh, a deacon. I see. I see. So then I started the process um, with the the assistance of the the pastor of my parish to become a deacon. Okay. So so let let's just suppose uh, I wanted to become a permanent deacon. The first step I would do is talk with the talk the, with your local pastor. Okay. And and I, I'm assuming. Uh, they want to make sure that you're a, a man of moral uh, uh, courage, right? Moral upbringing. So let, let's suppose that I um, I pass that scrutiny. Um, what would be my next step then? Then you apply. You would work through the director of the diaconate in, in, at your oh, diocese. See. Oh, okay. Um, he would probably talk with you some, oh, okay. probably over the phone, or perhaps even person to person if you live local to him. Uh, and then he would help you in that regard, um, as far as trying to further your discerning as to whether or not you wanted to be a deacon. Okay. And I, I'm assuming that it's a two or three years learning, or educational programs, or? The, well, the process in the Diocese of Columbus, the process of becoming a deacon is a four-year process. Oh, four-year. Okay. During the first year, which is called the year of aspirancy, that's when you undergo, you, that's the beginning of the application process early in the year. You undergo some scrutiny. Uh, they get references sure. of people in your parish, and you have to provide personal references. and. <clears throat> then they go through, a, there's some psychological testing. Um, I, I think that's good. You know, I, I, I think since, since you're ministering to many different groups of individuals, uh, we, we want to make sure that, that the individual has a good, clear, conscious, and sound mind mm -hmm. kind of thinking. So I think that's good. And since I am married, or I was married at the time of going through the aspirancy process, my wife pay, played an important part of this. Oh. She had to give her explicit permission for me to be a deacon. Oh, really? Oh. Because the church considers, if you're married, your marriage is your first sac your first duty. Response, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, you were married before you became huh. a deacon. So your primary responsibility then would be to your family. Oh, okay. All right. I I, I would imagine that um, you know it's uh, first of all from what I've seen with Catholic priests, uh, they start early in the morning and end late at night uh, sure. for for six sometimes seven days. And and I would imagine that if you threw in a family, it's uh, even more difficult. Sure. Sure. And so, um, the the wife would be the if if you were married the the wife would indicate yay or nay. Yes. And uh, obviously, your wife said yay. Yes. <laughs> so then, then so that sort of covers the first year. That's the first year. Okay. And then at the end of the first year, they have a in the diocese of Columbus they have a a ceremony as part of the mass 
called the admission to candidacy. Oh, okay. And then from then beginning in January of the next year, you begin your formal training I see. through classwork and okay. so forth. So, so where did you take your classwork? All our classwork was done at the Pontifical College Josephine in Columbus. That, and, and that's in Worthington, Columbus, Ohio. Yes. Oh, very good. And um, is, is that, I, I, I understand that the Pontifical College Josephine, uh, that has its uh, responsibilities through Rome. Yes. And, and so it's considered a nationwide mm -hmm. um, uh, seminary. Right. Uh, there are other places, like, like for instance, you know, there are some dioceses have their own seminaries. Correct. Uh, and it's it's my understanding that that the Josephinum has both a college and a theology department. Yes. And so when you take those courses, uh, I, I'm assuming you went you undertook some of the theolo theology coursework. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, and w were there other seminarians there, or was it all different deacons? Uh, the classes that we took, or I took, we were all a class of deacons. Oh, okay. The men in the diocese oh, okay. who were going through the, the tr formation process. Okay. So we did not interact directly with the seminarians. Okay. Although I, I did, and many of them. Yeah, you, you people, if you're at the same place. Well, yeah. We knew some of the yeah. seminarians, oh, and we did talk with them occasionally. But as far as our classes were concerned, we did not interact directly with the seminarians. Now, our instructors, many of our instructors, were also instructors at the Pontifical College Josephinum. So they were priests uh, who taught us sacramental theology, for example. Um, other instructors were uh, diocesan priests. Oh, okay. They would t teach us things like uh, uh, canon law. Okay. Part, the important parts of canon law sure. that we would be yeah. dealing with. Then others were lay instructors. So, so what, uh, you know, the, the coursework that you undertook, uh, were, were there any, any specific ones that really touched your soul, if you want to call it that? I mean, uh, I, I, I know that in your coursework, there are some courses that really have a tremendous amount of mm -hmm. meaning to you. I think the course that probably touched me the most was the sacramental theology. Okay. Um, this was taught by a, a priest who was uh, in charge of the theology department at the time uh, at the Josephinum, and he was very moving in his uh, instruction and really gave us a really good um, idea about sacramental theology. Ah, okay. Ah, that, that would be uh, that would be interesting to, to learn more about and maybe in future shows that you, that you have, maybe you can sort of delve into what is sacramental theology and mm -hmm. things of that nature. Uh, so, so you undertook the coursework for three, three years? It was three years after okay. that, yes. All right. We would take two classes. The courses were kind of divided up into a quarter system type. Uh, we went in the winter from January through March roughly, then March I through see. June, then September through December. Okay, so it sort of followed the... It followed the, kind of the quarter yeah, system. Yeah. Um, and each of those quarters we took two different classes. Okay. Then in the summer we had a, we were basically off during the summer, but we did have a formation yeah. a weekend during the summer to teach us certain things like oh, very good. how do you, what do you do at a mass if you're assisting a priest. So we had a, a weekend that we just practiced assisting a priest at a I see, I see. So, so it's not a, not a matter that you took one course and then ta-da, you're permitted. Right. It, it sounds like it was very intensive. It was. You know, as, as far as the different the, theology kinds of courses that mm -hmm. an individual expects to have. Yes. Uh, and so uh, when after the coursework, uh, I, I'm assuming then that uh, you became ordained. Well, yes, ordained in November 2012. And, and then were you assigned a parish, or how does that work? Typically, 
you were assigned a parish in your area. Uh, for example, being down in, in the Portsmouth Wheelersburg area, I was assigned to uh, the what was termed as the Scioto County Consortium. Oh, okay. Uh, which is basically the parishes of Scioto County. Now, I, I know that they have seven parishes, and as a matter of fact, I've seen you at some of the the different churches. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, so. Currently, we have three deacons in, in Scioto County, and we serve at each of the parishes on a rotational basis. Oh, okay, all right. And there, you you assist at the mass, yes, uh, serving the the priest during uh, the different parts of the. Uh, and I, you know, a, a future show might be better understanding. You know, especially if people come in and they've never been to a Catholic service, what some of the different parts would be. Um, because I, I know people have asked me or they've come to the wrong conclusion. You know, they're standing and sitting and yeah, yeah and, and, and things of that nature. And there's there's different segments that have a high relevance and a high importance. Uh, so you are ordained. And then uh, you started working with uh, the different parishes inside a county. So what are some of the things that you uh, sort of gravitated to or found yourself responsible for? Okay. A deacon is ordained to service within the Catholic Church. Um, if you remember the story of uh, St. Stephen. Ah. In, in the Acts of the Apostles, the, the Apostles were primarily concerned with proclaiming the Word of God. And then other people were di distributing food and aid to, oh, okay. to the different oh, okay. widows, orphans, destitute people. And there was a complaint from the, the Hellenist uh, uh, Christians the, the Greek Christians, that the Jewish Christians were getting more of this aid than the Hellenist Christians. I see. So at that time, the apostles decided that they would uh, call, at that time, seven men to help with the distrib distribution I of see. the goods. I see. St. Stephen was one of them, and I don't remember all their names. Nicanor was one, Prochorus. Yeah, uh, St. Saint Stephen, though, uh, was, was one of those assistants. Yes. Yeah, okay. So that's actually where the diaconate first started. Ah, uh, okay. All right, yeah. see. Then St. Stephen, as you, if you remember, becomes, becomes the, first, the church's first martyr. Yes. He is stoned later on. Yes, okay. <clears throat> so, so the deacons are ordained to a life of service within the church. I see. Uh, things like uh, aiding the poor, uh, distributing food to I the... I see. Okay. And we all... Visiting the sick, for example, taking communion to the sick, uh, that type of thing. Okay. Uh, now, we can do a lot of other things also outside in the community. Uh, for example, I work, I help with our RCIA program. The RCIA. Right of, of Christian Initiation for Adults. I see. Okay. I work with a group, and we have a team that gives... Um, instruction to people who want to join the Catholic Church. So, oh, okay. So so if I have not been a member of the Catholic Church and wanted to join, I would go through the IRCIA R -C -I -A process. Okay. All right. Another thing I do is I volunteer at a uh, what's called the Shepherd's Table. Shepherd's Table. That's uh, run out of the Catholic Social Services at their facility in Portsmouth where they provide a hot meal to anybody in the community who wants to walk in. And not just to Catholics, but to anyone? Anyone. Ah, huh, very and good. All you have to do is come in. Uh, they would like to have your name so they keep sure. track, but just walk in, uh, give us your name, come back and you eat a hot meal. I think that's great. And that, that happens once a week. 
Huh, very good. Excellent. And I have, in the past, I have taken communion to the homebound. Okay, all right. So, so of, of the many things uh, that a, a priest and a deacon and different parts of the uh, church community, what's some of your favorite things? What, what are some things that really put you, puts you in touch with God? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I understand. Um, two things, actually, that I particularly enjoy. One is working at Shepherd's Table. I, okay. I go down there on a weekly basis. Oh, very good. Uh, the second thing is, is baptism. I enjoy watching baptisms. Um, I've had the privilege of baptizing four or five of my grandchildren since I've been uh -huh. ordained. Oh, very good. And, and I really like baptism. Um, Just uh, can you explain a little bit more why you like it? You know, is it the, the well, fact that they're, they're being uh, incorporated into uh, the religion or? They, uh, when you were baptized, you were, base, you were born again, if you will, oh, into the Catholic faith. Oh, I see, okay. Um, and this allows you to partake in the rest of the sacraments of the oh, Catholic okay. Church. Right. That, that is the beginning. Okay, all right. Um, and as a result of that, I've come to appreciate more and more my own baptism okay. that allows me to participate particularly in the Eucharist. Uh, the Eucharist, when we participate in the Eucharist, we accept and uh, take into ourselves the body and blood of Christ. Okay. And that gives us the spiritual strength to carry on and do the things that we need to do for the good of the world as a whole. Oh, okay. All right. You, you know, in, in, in future shows, and I know you have probably mapped out a, a number of different programs, etc., uh, but understanding the sacraments, you know, they, uh, we banter about the sacraments, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, some of the sacraments include baptism right. and uh, holy matrimony right. uh, and confirmation mm -hmm. and uh, confession and well, there consecration, are, you know. There are seven sacraments. Okay. All right. Three are the, called the sacraments of initiation which are baptism, uh, confirmation, and Holy Communion. Okay. Then there's two sacraments of service, that is Holy Orders and marriage. Oh, okay. Then, what are the others called? But, but, the, two, the two other sacraments are the anointing of the sick and I always have trouble. Well, you know, the, uh, you, you're going to be talking about the, the sacraments more, so... Uh, um, Cameras do that. Cameras do that. Cameras do that. <laughs> but on, on the same token, there's, there's a lot of different things that deacons, permanent deacons, undertake uh, that people really don't... the, the laity mm -hmm. don't really know that they do. And... Uh, you know, I, I, I think that when you serve in the Mass and, and uh, assist with the priest, etc., he gets all the, the glory and you get to, to clean up after him. Well, <laughs> you not, know what I mean? not, not really. Uh, it, it's an honor to serve up there at the altar okay, with, with a priest, regardless. Good, good. Yeah, I, that, I, you know, I make light of that. But many times we're all focused just on priests, mm -hmm. when in reality, in a congregation, uh, it's really comprised of many individuals right. uh, that, that keep that congregation going. Mm -hmm. It's just not one person. Right. And I, I think you can testify to that, that the other two deacons that you work with mm -hmm. and yourself uh, are surrounded also with the staff of, of uh, uh, in individuals, I know in the uh, uh, the parish parishes in in uh, uh, Syeda County, you have at least five or six other individuals that are involved in finance and mm -hmm. education, uh, uh, working with the RCIA and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're 
Deacons are just a small portion of what actually goes on within the church as a whole. We have our responsibilities and we can accept as much responsibility as we wish and still balance that with our family life and yeah. whatever the priest wants to allow us to do within the parish. Sure. Uh, in some parishes, specifically very large parishes, uh, the priest may be, oh, I'm sorry, the deacon may be the business administrator of that parish. Oh, really? I didn't know that. So they would run the business aspects of that parish. Um, now, obviously, the pastor of the parish has final responsibility right. of what happens, where money gets spent, and so forth. Right. But the there would be guidelines for him, for the deacon who is the administrator, to follow. Well, that, that sort of makes sense. You know, if in some Catholic parishes you have a church, you have a school system, mm -hmm. you have individuals working on different programs like uh, what, what you were mentioning, etc. And there's only so many hours in a day, so they have to rely upon individuals to administer the spiritual needs and the physical needs and the physical needs uh, a lot of there's a lot of lay employees of each parish uh, a secretary the financial manager may be a lay employee the business administrator may be a lay employee you have your custodial staff and so forth yeah and I, I think that's that's really really good that uh, the the church uh, can can authorize other individuals to take care of some of those tasks, so so that way the priest can administer to the religious services mm -hmm. and the spiritual needs of the people. Yes, that's that is his primary responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting. Well, I, I, I look forward to uh, the program that you're going to be doing. Um, I, you know, th this is an educational program. Uh, but it's also an inspirational program uh, because each one of us, uh, little human beings that we are, always need to touch uh, our lives and our souls with, uh, with the Spirit, with God, with Jesus Christ, or with, with any, any individual uh, that we hold in reverence. And I, I really appreciate you coming on, Terry, and being able to give us a really good understanding of some of the things that the Roman Catholic uh, Church and its organization offer to people. It was my pleasure. Well, I, I think that's, I, I look forward to the guests, et cetera. Um, I, uh, in regards to uh, Terry Acox, I wanna give a shout out about uh, Dwayne Rigsby. Dwayne is our person behind the scenes, our magician that we call him. Uh, I'm talking with Deacon Terry A. Cox, who has spiritual, uh, inspirational focus, and thank you for listening.